But in real life, you're targeting the intermediary points to shape out that response that you're looking to do. And masterful performance of that stuff to a fluid outcome is the highest, in my mind, like the highest form of our Kung Fu, bro. Like it just is. Watch the tape. The best athletes watch the tape. That's how you know what you're doing. Hey, did you know you can actually earn BACBCUs if you're listening to this episode? If you'd like to learn more, including about our Behavior Analyst Certification Board CEUs, that is continuing education units for people that hold the credentials by the BACB, you can go to explanatoryfiction.com and find this episode. Welcome to Explanatory Fiction. It's very important that you know how this podcast is structured. We've randomly generated this case. The variables are entirely fictional. That's right, because with the power of math and science, you can actually do these things now. In fact, the name Esme Aubrey was randomly generated too. And the episode art, you guessed it, also made by artificial intelligence. But the best part is our team is real and the conversations that ensue are designed as a game that you get to play along with us. In each episode, we have one person that is evaluating the case from a clinical decision-making model and the others are accomplices of mine who are trying to stump the analyst. Our challenge to you is can you figure out a possible treatment model before us? Here we go. Esme Aubrey is a seven-year-old girl who lives in Los Angeles County in California. She has an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis since she was three years old, and she's received behavior analytic therapy in the past via an in-home therapy model. But now she receives services through the local public school district. Her BCBA Darcy oversees a self-contained room with an RBT who works with Esme every day. Darcy is someone who's been in the field for a few years and is actually someone you know from graduate school. She reached out to you because she knew you were going to be in town that evening for a lecture at Santa Clarita. And she just wanted to catch up and review Esme's case because she's, well, a little stomped. Hey, Dimitri, it's great to see you again. Thank you for coming in. It's wild that you happened to be in the area when I reached out. Hey, Darcy, so lovely to see you. It's just so nice to see your success and your practice. I'm just blown away. I same to you. Thank you oh for coming gosh. in. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So, uh, tell me what, what what's going on? What, what yeah. Can I help you okay. With? Sounds so like we you got have. A stumper on you. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So Esme is one of my students, um, and I don't know. She's kind of tricky. So I'm excited for you to kind of take a look. Um, we can go into my office and go sit down, and I can show you kind of the programs that we're working. Sounds on. great. Um, Mr. Aubrey, uh, her father, signed everything in the consent packet that we sent your way, so I can show you Esme and what we've been doing so far. And then he picks up Esme every day, so I already asked if he can meet with you this afternoon. Okay. Well, what's the big issue that's really got you stumped, just in general? Before we get into a bunch of details, like, is, what's the theme? Uh, she's just not learning as quickly as I think she could be. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I mean, but she is learning. Yeah, she is learning. Um, it's not really behavior management. That's not the problem. Um, cause we've pretty much avoided any really high magnitude behaviors for the last six months. Uh, so all we're seeing is the beginning of a tantrum, but that's not really the issue. The issue is okay. still activation. So this is a, this is an actual like learning problem. So you need a, a skill breakdown scenario here, huh? Yeah, that's what okay. I'm thinking. Let me grab Charlie, our RBT, too. To oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hi, Charlie. Oh, hey. How's it going? Nice to meet you, buddy. Doing all right. How about you? Lovely. Lovely. So tell um, me about these uh, be, Tell me about these behaviors you guys are chaining. What, what behaviors are we chaining? Well, uh, right now we're working on toothbrushing, hand washing, toileting. Uh, those are big ones we're working on chaining for, uh, but we're also working on matching sample and receptive labeling. Okay. So you said there was a learning problem. What what particular skills are you having difficulty like getting her to acquire at a reasonable rate and get to independence? Or is it just across the board she just has a slow acquisition rate? It's getting it to independence. So um, we are targeting this like different skills, like the toileting, toothbrushing, things like that. Um, and we're breaking them into like very small steps. We're practicing that to fluency and then we're reintroducing them into the behavioral chain, but she's just not doing it independently. Okay. Um, What's your hypothesis? She definitely has some behavioral rigidity that makes it very difficult. Um, for low to me, time out. Low, least to most prompting. Yeah. When you're saying behavior rigidity relative to the skill, what do you mean by that? Isn't like she's stutter stepping her way through it. She's trying to rigidly adhere to patterns that are unnecessary, or she's kind of built in a shortcut and now she's having trouble going back. I mean, give me a little bit more context in terms of when you say she's falling into some rigid patterns or she wants to do them all in sequence. And if you interrupt that, that's a problem. Like, 
<clears throat> and rigidity can mean a lot of things. What do you mean by that? Okay, so we're getting to specific steps of the behavior that keep requiring prompting. So at certain points, she gets stuck on a step and then it'll take three to five seconds of repeating it. And she's just kind of blinking, staring at us during this time. Okay, so what, which particular skill is this happening on? Okay, so we're seeing it a lot kind of across the board. Um, it's a lot like I mean, in the toothbrushing, with toileting, just she'll kind of just pause in the middle and then start. Can I, can, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having some problems following here. So are you guys like doing like a whole bathroom routine situation where you're chaining a bunch of complex skills together? Like a night, like a nighttime routines or something or morning routine situation? Or are we talking about just in general, whenever she's doing a complex like response that involves, you know, a, a behavior chain or some kind of sequence, there is some sticking points across the board in every single complex type of response. <laughs> Um, I would say more the second one. We are trying to target quite a few different behaviors that um, are okay. in her like nighttime or morning time routine, okay. but she's not expected to do, you know, like all six of these together. Okay. So when you said you were training at the fluency before, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Because you're, you're taking the step you said and you're training at the fluency. What mm -hmm. do you mean? Like so we're breaking it into the specific tool skill. We're having her practice that specific small skill. So for example, if it's like brushing her teeth, we're having her pick up her toothbrush multiple times within like the context of a short timing. Um, so that way we can put it back <clears throat> into the whole chain. Okay. And she's stutter stepping. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So you did a component, you did a composite analysis or component analysis, obviously. Mm -hmm. You're breaking it down into tool skills, so you are targeting those. You are building those into fluency. They're not going back and generalizing or engaging in novel generative responses. So that's a good intervention that's out. Are you guys, uh, what's the, what is the general prompting strategy that you are using? Um, we're using least to most prompting. Okay. Is it possible that that's the problem? It's certainly possible. Okay. Have you considered that that's the problem? I've considered a lot of different things. That could be the problem. Okay. I promise I'm not a cop. Okay. Like you're not, anything you say can <laughs> will not be used against you. I promise. I'm, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of these things. I'm trying to understand your thinking process. <clears throat> okay. So is least to most the only prompting strategy that you've used or have you used other prompting strategies? I can speak to a bit of what our uh, chaining has been looking like these days. If you're, if you're interested, Dimitri. Oh, I, I'm fascinated, Dimitri's. Charlie, please illuminate me. So for most skills, we're doing total task chaining. Um, we're noticing a lot of behavioral rigidity um, at parts where she's mastered it in isolation. And we're looking to, um, Apply it in the context of the task analyses. Okay. You have, you chunked sheets, it, have you chunked micro sequences? Uh, I am an RBT. I do not know what that is. Okay. So chunking it in micro sequences would be like, rather than looking at building the fluency, then from the taking the individual fluency or the individual skills fluency, and then attaching it to the secondary skill proceeding or following it. Um, and then building that just section to a fluence performance and then building outward from that, that point rather than start that rather than building from a top or a bottom of I the mean, skill. We, we haven't tried that. The, the thing that we're running into is like, I mean, I don't know how to put this in a, a behavior analysis context. Just say it like a human being and we'll figure it out from there. Oh, I mean, it just seems like she knows what to do, but isn't she's waiting for us to tell her what to do. So you suspect a certain degree of prompt dependency. Am I understanding that correctly? Oh, that is, that is what the words I was looking for. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Then uh, Darcy, you, you are you do you concur with your colleague? Yeah, definitely. I feel like we could kind of show you too what she does when we don't help her. Okay, show me. All right, you observe uh, Charlie working with a seven year old girl. She uses some vocal approximation. She'll point at some things. She seems pretty agreeable and happy. They go and they practice putting on and taking off their coat. She goes and she puts it on. They zip up. They walk around a little bit to make it a little bit more natural. They walk back. He gestures towards the coat hook. She takes off her coat. She stands there. She looks to him and holds it there. This goes on for about 15 to 20 seconds. Charlie goes ahead and taps the hook again. And then she goes and she puts it on and comes over. 
You see that she's gonna go, they go and they get a little hygiene box, they go to a sink in the room, and she goes to brush her teeth, she puts the toothpaste on the toothbrush, she screws the cap back on, and she just brushes it in the top left quadrant of her mouth for a minute. So what are your thoughts, doctor? Well, I, I got a lot of thoughts, man. There's definitely, uh, okay, so let's talk about what's going on here. So basically what's going on here is we're looking at uh, Esme here. and I mean, she can obviously demonstrate the skill in isolation. She can perform the skill. She's just exhibiting a certain degree of prompt dependency. But the thing is, is the prompt dependency just simply, you know, your, your run of the mill, like I want something, I, I just not sure how to do this completely on my own. I'm just accustomed to having people guide me through it. So I'm like hesitating or is there like, is there a particular latency problem here where it's soliciting corrective feedback almost in a defiant fashion? Um, now, obviously I don't think it's necessarily egregious to use the word defiance, but there is this like strong hesitation where she's actually looking specifically for confirmation from you. So there's a social element to it. There's some attention element. So it's definitely, I've tried to wait her out. Um, we've waited for yeah. a while. Um, right. So, I mean, I think there's a couple things. I think we want to definitely give her the benefit of the doubt and just assume that this is a an error in, a, in our shaping procedures and our prompting strategies that we've used with Esme. So there's a couple different ways that you can go about doing this. I, I would, you can pick one of them or you can do them both simultaneously. It shouldn't have any specific impact per se, but I'll go back to what I said before. You could look, focus on this in terms of chunking. So if you want to take more of a precision teaching or fluency approach to it, you can take those particular acceleration rates that she's achieved that are satisfactory for the isolated skill and then start building it out in sequence with just, you know, the preceding and then the following skill and like build it out from the center rather than a stereotypical situation when you're teaching a behavior chain where you know you're saying do the thing like so let's say brush teeth and they follow the sequence from the beginning and then your your, your whatever presentation style there or whatever presentation um, pr protocol you've decided will dictate your your prompting intervention the other thing you can do is really just honestly admit the fact that maybe at least the most is wrong and you need to shape it to a fluent performance. And when I say fluent, I mean it more in the colloquial sense. I don't mean it in terms of like how we think about it in terms of specifically rate of response. I mean like performing it smoothly, novelly, independently from beginning to end as in like one fluid performance of the skill. <clears throat> and that would actually mean changing your prompting strategy from a least to most to a most to least actually. It feels really weird going in like a full physical when I've seen her demonstrate the skill. Like, I don't want to be too intrusive in that. Well, I mean, you can choose to feel weird or you can choose for her to not be able to independently complete these tasks forever. So, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, my, my thought is, I, I mean, I thought we were supposed to be doing least restrictive uh, environment and um, that feels oh, pretty. I see. So you have an ethical objection. <clears throat> I, I mean, I, not a, it's okay if you do. I'm not mad about it. I'm I just trying to clarify. Ethical, it just feels weird. Okay. I don't think you're being unethical in what you're asking, but I, it feels weird. Okay. I mean, a lot of things feel weird, but we do them. So I'm not. I'm not really sure, like how to address your strange emotion. I mean, I'm just telling you how it is, Doc. Okay. Look, man, I get it. the The idea of least restrictive is not always start with the least restrictive. The actual phrase or the actual concept is least restrictive necessary to appropriately produce the outcome or behavioral response you are looking to create or shape. So in this situation, the least restrictive or least intrusive intervention necessary to get her where she needs to go is adjusting our prompting strategy to a most to least prompting strategy for the following reasons. For example, because she's hesitating in that particular area and she's explicitly seeking you out, that means there was either somewhere a failure to withdraw appropriately over time or there's this desire or something going on where she is specifically soliciting another person or being for her to be able to do that so either way okay we need to remove you as a necessary prompting a necessary stimulus to initiate that response well the only way that we're going to be able to do that is to go back to the drawing board start from scratch and reteach the skill to its fluid performance from beginning to end. And the only way that you can do that is to ensure that you get the smooth contact from one at one uh, point in the chain to the next point in the chain throughout the entire thing in sequence over and over and over again to be able to accomplish that goal. So 
For example, you doing the least the most strategy that you have been doing right now creates this instance where you're giving her a three to five second response time and then you're slowly moving into prompter, which actually creates just enough of a break in between those particular points of each, those particular steps in the chain that gives her an opportunity to break the contingency and try to reestablish a new uh, contingency for your attention. Even though it seems like it's one singular chain, it's multiple contingencies within the chain. That's what I'm trying to say here. You're trying to reestablish a singular contingency for the entire chain in order for its performance to yield a particular reinforcement that she's looking for. In this case, some kind of social validation. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just, she does, when we're doing her schedule and we're doing one of these tasks, she just, she'll do this like thing where she stares right at, stares right at you and she like flutters her eyelashes and blinks really quickly. And like, I feel like she knows exactly what I'm asking her to do. I understand what you're saying, but I mean, I, I don't know how to address it. We can't really read her mind. I, I, like, I mean, I guess I just, right. I'm not used to this, uh, hand over hand stuff. Okay. Well, we I mean, tried like, it in the past and she's super compliant for it. She, like, I think I'm the problem sure here is that you're, I think the problem here is that you're seeing, and maybe this is just a communication problem we're having in terms of what does a physical or hand over hand prompt mean? And then what does a fading procedure look like over time, et cetera? So let's just talk about then prompt withdrawals. Okay. Because you shouldn't necessarily have to use a physical prompt the entire way through the chain and master it with a physical prompt and then systematically remove it. That's not how it should be talking about shaping or fading procedure of the prompts, especially when we're trying to perform like an active chain or like a daily living skill like this. The analogy I like to teach RBTs or people who are working directly with people is you have to think about yourself as a sculptor working with clay, all right? And you have to look at your prompts as applying the necessary degree of pressure to create the particular visage, the particular mold that you're trying to get out of the clay at the, at the specific points that you need it to get your shape to emerge out of it, which means sometimes you pull, apply a little bit more pressure, sometimes you apply a little bit less but as you're moving your way from the top to bottom of it, you're ensuring that the entire performance of the chain occurs in one fluid motion without opportunity for her to break, pause, and look to you, which is what's happening right now. You want to interrupt those breaks, those pauses, to ensure that she's contacting the previous endpoint step to the next step to the next step so you can get a fluid performance of the skill. So... I'm not saying go manhandle her when I say physical prompt. I just mean be prepared to be there to guide her, holding on to her hands and, and gently getting her to where she needs to go. And then if you can pull away, if you if you if you feel no resistance and she's going towards the defense, pull away. But just be immediately ready to get right in there to shape it out to where it needs to be. Gotcha. Okay. Does that help help alleviate your anxiety in terms of what I'm trying to say in her, relative to physical intervention? Yeah, yeah, a bit. That's Great. Not <clears throat> Fantastic. So um, give it a run. Do some do some of those like small sequence chunking, micro chunking, micro sequencing and isolation trials. And then when you perform the entire skill, switch to the most to least and kind of fade it over time and just see if that helps because um, that should address the latency problem that you're having there in between the chain, in the, in the middle of the chain. Gotcha. Okay. Darcy, you on? And really, and really the other thing too is in, for your, in your case too, because we already know that she's looking to your eyes for contact, you already know she's looking for some kind of confirmation. And there's a, there's, it's, it's pretty common in these like big complex chains to inadvertently provide excessive, like unintended prompts with your eyes or where you're focusing and stuff. So really, really practice and really be conscientious and mindful of, of, of maintaining a, a high degree of neutrality in your face while you're going through it so that you're not inadvertently prompting her throughout the process as well with like your eyes or with a social cues that nonverbal social cues that you may not be thinking about. That's another thing that you should definitely keep in mind. Miss Hassan, Esme's father has arrived. He just signed in and is on his way down to meet you. Hey, Darcy. Hey, Charlie. How's it going? Hey, Milo. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Good to see Milo. Doing great. What's up, Esme? Hey, you must be Dimitri. I think I, I think I signed some papers for you to, to observe my kid. Hi, hi, Milo. Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Uh, did you get a chance to ch yeah. check everything out today? Yeah, yeah. Love your daughter. Cutest pie. Perfect. Ooh, what, what a lovely little girl. Perfect. So what what's going on? I mean, we Darcy and I have a great relationship. I trust everything she's doing. I just know that they've they've expressed a couple of concerns. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, there were just some procedural tweaks that I think we need to make and a couple of minor adjustments to the way that we're like presenting the program. And I had a chance to give them a, a pretty good detailed uh, role play and discussion on that. So I think that we should be good there. That She should be able to debrief you about that um, at a later time. But um, I, I feel pretty confident that, you know, what we talked about should be helpful. Well, you have to such what, an involved parent. What's that? In, what's that entail? I, we don't need anything big. Like we, we've got places to be. I'm just curious. What what are the tweaks you're making? You know, it's really just about, I think, readjusting the way that we're in the way that we're pr prompting her through the skills and the way that we're kind of engaging her throughout the whole process um, where we should just refocus on getting her through the whole thing fluidly without accidentally um, or just having built in pauses because that's really the problem. We need to address these pauses and these breaks in the, in the performance of the skill. So we're just going to shape the change over the prompting procedure. Um, so that way we just go from beginning to end very fluidly without any pauses. And then we'll work on fading out the prompts from there. So that's really what it looks like. And then another thing too, that we talked about is a, another way that we can practice just that skill. Like they were doing it with the fluency. I'm assuming that you're familiar with the jargon. So forgive me if you're Oh not. yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and just building out a little bit more complex fluency uh, practice point where they'll actually attach a secondary step to it and build one, two fluency rather than just one, 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 one with the, with the steps. Um, and then one, two, three, like, so that way we can get fluency of like chunks of the skill as well. Okay. So we'll add a fluency piece and then we're going to just change that fluid prompting procedure. Perfect. That makes sense. That's <laughs> awesome. That. Fantastic. Shouldn't be, a, shouldn't be a big deal for her, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's the beautiful thing about these things. Sometimes it's just minor stuff that when you're in the thick of it, you just, you know, it's, it's hard to see the forest or the trees. That's all. So I'm hoping that, that, and if that's not the case, you know, I'm always available. Darcy, you know, we, we had a great relationship and supervision and stuff. I always love hearing from her. So I'd be happy to consult again if, if, you know, this doesn't really work. So Dar Darcy is like giving us some beautiful like schedules and stuff that we're using at home. We're trying to use the same things while we're at home too. Is there something that we should be working on while we're at, at home that, that, matches what you're talking about that's going on here you know for, for this particular thing i think right now not really i i don't i don't think so um the only thing that i would say in general is if you're seeing a lot of situations where she's like pausing and looking over to you for confirmation before she acts maybe try to resist the urge and again i don't even know if you do this but if you do if this is what's going on um try to like resist the urge to over prompt her and just tell her exactly how to do something really just get in there and guide her to the thing and just withhold your your facial response and your non-verbal social cueing that you would have um because it seems like she's looking for kind of like that um, body language, nonverbal confirmation that she's on the right track. I see that during some things that we do at home where she pauses and she'll go over. It's just a little bit, it's tough sometimes because sometimes she does her like blinking rigid piece and she's not really looking over at me when, when that part happens. Is there a way I should act differently when that part happens or is it just the same thing? I mean, I guess the blinking thing came up uh, and that's the second time it's come up. So I'm just going to ask. Have you ever had her checked out for seizures? Are you concerned about that? Uh, we've done medical evals. I, I don't think there's anything underlying there. They just, when she got her autism diagnosis, they also said that she had just some impulsivity or, or behavioral rigidity. I don't know what, okay. what they, okay. so we- then, then if that's the case, if, if you've had her medically checked out and there's not some kind of absent seizure or medical problem underlying that, it is just some rigidity, then really there's only, there's a couple of different ways to handle that. In this case, it's really not severe enough for me to say you should do anything other than what you are normally doing, because sometimes doing something is worse than doing nothing. And this might be one of those situations where you might accidentally create a problem by trying to fix something that's not that big of an issue right now. And that might just naturally kind of work itself out if we address these other problems in a certain way where we're expecting complete performance of skills over time. So just let it ride. When that yeah. Happens. Yeah, man. Let it ride. Okay. No, you're that's... not the therapist either. So, you know, you got a lot of stuff going on. Your pops, your dad, you know, yeah. let them do their work and you guys live your lives. Sweet. No, that, that works for me, man. I appreciate Sweet. you coming in and, and helping help them point them in the right direction. Yeah, no problem. I just Darcy, appreciate thanks for the getting them up. That's a, that's a great idea. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for coming, Dimitri. Of great. course. Lovely. Always nice to see you, Darcy. All right. Ezra. Thanks, Dr. D. No problem, buddy. You stay dangerous, Holmes. You made it. This is the point in which you can pause 
Think about what you maybe would have done differently. Think of if there's any themes throughout this as well. We're going to break character here and this just turns into a typical podcast where it's just an open discussion. I hope you enjoy. Dimitri, within that, we talked a little bit and it kept being brought up. So you you caught on to that pretty quick about um, within those behavior chain pauses, what could be potentially attention seeking versus a little bit of rigidity, impulsivity. And you said it wasn't really something to worry about. We don't want to potentially create a bigger behavioral situation by worrying about that rigidity. Would you mind digging into that uh, kind of decision point based on what you were hearing? I mean, it was like micro latency pauses in the middle of skills and looking for confirmation. That's a lot more prompt dependency than it is rigidity, to be frank. I mean, the eye thing or the eye fluttering thing might have been some kind of repetitive behavior, but I don't know if I would have characterized anything like that as rigidity. I mean, rigidity has like a compulsiveness to it, right? There's a compulsion. <clears throat> and the whole thing didn't smell of compulsion to me. It, it, it read a lot more as... You know, I'm just really used to looking over while I'm doing stuff and just getting a nod or a wink or a, a smile or, a, you know, a, some kind of like verbal look towards where I'm headed that confirms to me I'm on the right track and I, I'm gotten really accustomed to that. So that's what I'm looking for in the middle of these complex skills that I'm performing. Um, and so it really was a matter of un- identifying that dependency in particular and that it is just like this social mediated thing and doing your best as the clinician who's doing the intervention itself to remove yourself from the chain. So, because basically what happened with the least most uh, strategy they were using was that you, you, the proverbial you, the interventionist kind of prompted and and shaped themselves into the chain. So they become a member of the chain. What does Um, scrapping a behavior chain or a step in the chain? What does scrapping the chain and beginning anew, like you mentioned, entail i like i like the clusters of behaviors for the smaller chains to check because it wasn't working with one skill in in that isolation influency but what does what's the beginning anew of a chain when certain skills are already independent what's that look like i'm not sure if i understand your question so you're saying like why would you restart it if already some aspects of it are independent is that what you're asking yeah i would say how do you go about the nuance if they have some of these things and i know that certain steps are not being faded but i'm gonna start rechaining and trying to build that behavior into behavior chain from from the beginning well because we got to remember that a behavior chain is maybe a sequence of individual movement cycles but in order for those movement cycles to be meaningful performance of a skill they have to occur together in sequence. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So just because you can perform aspects of it to a certain degree of fluency or novel independent performance, it's irrelevant because that's not what makes those particular skills meaningful. They are only meaningful when they are occurring all together. So that means that you really didn't teach anything if they're not occurring all together and the skill isn't being performed despite the appearance of independence. So it's almost like a false positive of independence and being able to like just know that idea and recognize it and say, okay, like that's great that this person can't perform these aspects of it, but regardless of their ability to perform these aspects of it, they're meaningless until they're performed together. You run a big risk of just like totally faulty stimulus control on all those responses too, right? 100% correct. Yeah. Yep. And that's what we were dealing with. It was a faulty stimulus control because it, 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 and that's how a lot of people do that when they, because there's so much inadvertent prompting that most people go through because I don't actually, that's just, that's an interesting, we, I, you know, it's, I, I was raised by some pretty rigid interventionists. So like I'm hypersensitive to the idea of inadvertent prompts <clears throat> in the way that I was taught as a BT back in the day. Um, but I don't really hear a lot of people talking about inadvertent prompting and its impact and its effects on skill acquisition and how much like having a very high degree of discipline when you're presenting a a command or an SD and how you are following through with that, the performance of the particular response you're looking for and how your prompts are relating to that so that they're clean, almost surgical prompts, right? Yeah, yeah. Rather than, you know, this interactive game that, you know, a lot of people might be performing because you know, the idea of like that sterile clinician versus that fun, compassionate person. But in reality, there is a line where when you are delivering an SD like that, if you're too lively and you're still too involved, you're interjecting yourself into the skill, actually. So you, whether or not you think your compassion matters at that point, it's actually counterproductive because you're creating false positives, false stimulus control, 
and um, you're interjecting yourself into these particular complex behavioral responses. One of my first supervisors on a case that I worked on as a BT was able to show me that responding to like this, it was, it was something like a match to sample program with some cards, but it was, a, it was, I believe like food items or something like that. It was for adults with intellectual disabilities. So in hindsight, it wasn't the best thing to be doing, but it was like semi-logical as to why we were there. One of them had this like, like big smudge in the corner and he was able to show me that like as that smudge was cleaned or like put back on there, <laughs> that you would see alterations in the responding. And yeah. it was it was just uh, pure faulty stimulus Subtle control. Use. And what what he did with that program is show me like, look at how sensitive his responding is to certain things that you're probably not even paying attention to. 100%. And then it opened up an entire different view to every skill that we were working on. And I was like, oh my gosh, like whether or not, you know, the light's on or this is how, like all of this could potentially control yeah. this. Um, and so yeah. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but I was taught that's to like exactly. Dude, be that is super such a worried all example. the time that you were going to potentially shape up something completely inappropriate. <laughs> well, it gets exaggerated. Like the, the greater the intellectual disability or, or co- lower the cognitive capacity of the performer, I feel like the greater the risk of that happens because the cleaner the stimulus control needs to be so that you're not muddying the waters. I mean, it's because if you look at like say a gen ed classroom or just like typical kids and the way that they learn, you know, there is a lot of noise. A ton of distractors. A lot of distractors, a lot of distraction across the board in their environment that they're able to kind of tune out because they're rule governed. And the lower and lower amount of rule governance that, you know, can exert stimulus control over you, the more and more sensitive you are to the physical nature of the stimuli that you're contacting and their visual appearance and placement and whatever to the exact way that you're taught to it, to the exact way that you contact it. So that also makes it, that also is why we don't see high degrees of generalization in these situations too, where you have to actually practice it across contexts and practice it across settings and people and, and different ways where you perform the skill. You don't just teach the skill and then just, you know, magically get that generalization. Is so, the yeah, reason that fun. you didn't tell other than kind of not feeding into the attention seeking delay is the reason that you told uh, Milo not to really focus or, or do the My, things Milo that was Milo was way too into wanting to be a parent about this stuff to that he would have hyper focused on any piece of feedback that I gave him and obviously over analyzed and overperformed it. So in a situation like this, since I'm not there to correct his zeal or zealousness, um, and I I wouldn't ask I would never interject myself to tell a parent what to do when I'm just on a consult. Like no matter how much they want me to give them feedback, I will not do it. I'm there to consult for the behavior analyst, not them. And I, I hold a steady line to that on purpose, especially with parents who are like overzealous, which again is great. Involved parents are fantastic. So I don't want to like make it sound like Milo would have been annoying to me or anything like that. Like that's a problem. It's a, it's a, like as a character, a, a real life analog to Milo is a, is an asset to a case, definitely not a liability, but me and the role that I'm playing in this scenario as a consult to a colleague and a friend bumping into the parent and asking me, what can I do? I'm not your behavior analyst. Yeah, we're not doing the drive-by behavior analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other piece was he lacks the formal training to follow a complex prompting right. sequence, which even folks that have that formal training are working on revamping their style. So it's not, it's not, it's not to be said. Oh yeah, we're shifting from a least to most to a most to least, and we're going to rechain from the first step. Like, yeah, it, no. it, it would, it would also be clouding the waters. Super counterproductive. Yes. So no, I would never permit that or or, or participate in it in that way. Uh, But yeah, that's a good question, man. I mean, that's probably something people do deal with a lot. And you know, it's, oh man, it's funny. You guys keep doing the doctor routine, but it's kind of, I feel like there's been an exaggerated version of it since like, it's been Mr. Doctor man, where it's like people look to solicit you for advice constantly for stuff. And like, you really have to like, check out this thing on my toe. (laughs) No, Dude, for real though. Like it's been crazy. How many situations like people who I've never talked to or I would never talk to or even maybe like have avoided <laughs> all of a sudden want to talk to me about stuff. And it's it's really it shocks me because I'm just like we would have never had this conversation before. But all of a sudden you went to it and it's like you're constantly being like this barrage of questions and like, you know, wanting to know your opinion on things. And I'm finding it more and more and more like I'm having to exert a lot of self-control and discipline and, and my urge to be a helping person. Cause I'm a fixer. 
a lot of the time. And it's not my natural state to, to just withhold information from people, but you gotta, you gotta exert that discipline and know where you are in the, in the, in the chain of information exchange. What does your ongoing conversation with Darcy look like moving forward? If she reaches out and you continue on this case is, is, is there higher learning outside of what she had in practicum or things outside the binders that you would point her towards oh, expanding her knowledge within? Yeah, I'd Mr. Miyagi her where she needed to go for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. She'd be, we'd be waxing on and waxing off for a while on a couple different things. I mean, here's the thing, dude. Like, I mean, I feel like we've done that through the years, you know, on different stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's not just about the reading, right? It's about the conceptualization. A lot of these problems, they're, they're intellectually understandable. You know, but in practice, it's more than being able to intellectually understand a thing. It's being able to close your eyes and see it in order to perform it in a way that's useful and actually reaches the outcome. And that's a totally different skill set. It's a totally different idea around what we're talking about. I mean, we especially in our types of procedures, when you're thinking about, for example, prompting strategy, one of the simplest things in the world is prompting strategies to explain to a person. That's one of the first things you learn how to do is how to prompt something. But masterful performance of any type of sequence of prompting would be at least the most, most the least what got graduated guidance or whatever the like. Okay. That's an art. That is, that is professional masterful teaching. And like, that's a thing that you only acquire over doing it over and over again, having someone watch you, maybe even seeing yourself on video, perform it and perform it sloppily, even though in your mind you're crushing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in order for you to actually learn how to be practiced and controlled and measured because there's so much self-control and physical discipline that goes into your timing, into your interjections, into your subtle nudges, into like exactly finding the medium point of pressure that's between a physical or even a partial physical prompt before you even get, you know, like there's all these different degrees. It's a spectrum of touch, right? It's biofeedback, biomechanical feedback that you're looking to perform. And it just so happens that we have these like very rigid terms for them that segment aspects of that spectrum. But in real life, you're targeting the intermediary points to shape out that response that you're looking to do. And masterful performance of that stuff to a fluid outcome is the highest, in my mind, like the highest form of our Kung Fu, bro. Like it just is. That feel versus real how you feel like you're doing versus what it's actually coming out. And, you know, I, I see it or the feedback is more so applied in what neutrality actually looks like and, Mm -hmm. and (laughs) neutral redirections versus unintentionally non-neutral redirections. Uh, But it is like, watch the tape. The best athletes watch the tape. That's how you know what you're doing. And that's, and honestly, I have to give credit to the, you know, you know, step-by-step back there. I'll give the shout out right now. You know, my supervisor, Jen Lalzern, um, and some of the BCBAs that I worked with back then who were really brought people, one of them, Morgan Alley was one. She was a really smart person. I like to give her credit there too. And even a person named Christine Austin, you know, I had professional disagreements with her in the past, but I think she's a brilliant mind and a great behavior analyst. Um, you know, those people, they focus on procedure in a way where it's like the performance matters. And I have to say that, you know, we went, the, the types of assessments that we went to, you know, the types of feedback that we got, um, going back and looking at the tape, like you didn't get your raise. You didn't get the pass. You didn't get the positive phrase unless you could, you know, unless it showed up on the tape and unless you actually did it right. So, you know, those, you know, th- those instances and those things at the time were super annoying and seemed super microcritical. But um, in the long run, I think that they helped create this conception of what skill acquisition is um, from a feel point of view that has been invaluable to me in my career. And I really think everyone should do it. Like if you are having trouble teaching skills, the best thing that you can do is teach the skill and put yourself on a camera and then go back and watch yourself teach that skill. You'll identify a hundred different mistakes that you didn't even realize you were making in the moment. Are your eyes moving when you're doing that? So are you inadvertently providing some kind of visual social cue while you're doing it? Are you presenting your stimuli in a, in a, in a, in a flat, even fashion in front of the person and then pulling back on your arms and then presenting your command or your SD before they're getting to respond? Or are you pulling away while you're saying it simultaneously, in which case that you're inadvertently physically or gesturally prompting? Um, are you providing 
bizarre social cues and the way that you're clutching your, you know, let's just say you're, you're doing some kind of like man training or something. You got some edible and you're doing some enticements or whatever. Are you already, are you, are you having nice clean breaks between the presentation of the command to the performance of the particular response you're doing to the delivery of the item that you're trying to get to? Like there's all these like sequencing and timing aspects to this that you got to go to the tape, put a, like, buy a $40, $30 El Cheapo GoPro on Amazon, like fake, you know, bootleg Am uh, <laughs> GoPro on Amazon and put it next GoPro. to you. Yeah. GoPro. Yeah. <laughs> and like watch yourself do these things and you'd be surprised kind of like how much better you would get just from doing that. When I was in grad school, we had a fish lab that we worked in. And so you had goldfish and this like operant tank. And there was a hoop that came in through the water it was started out to where it was unplugged and it was unplugged to be um from the computer the idea was that you'd be able to automate if you shape the behavior correctly of swimming through this hoop so imagine a goldfish and like a whatever it was 15 gallon tank um there was a little um grate at the bottom that was propped up just to prevent like bottom feeding if any food hit the bottom and you had this wand and this wand was like uh, 12, 18 inches long, little plunger at the top. And when you pressed it, it would uh, pop a little bit of food out at the bottom. So you'd have to crush the pellets or the little flakes just right to where when you put them in there and you just kind of would like snap it like with your thumb and just a little bit would come out. And that's how you would feed wherever they're at. And so there was all sorts of interesting stuff that would shape up there. One particular student, um, I remember like we would teach the basics of, you know, here's how you're going to deliver the reinforcer and things like this. And then people sometimes wanted the path of like, okay, show me how to shape this. Or other people were like, I'm going to shape this myself. And there was a student one day that was like two weeks into it and was just like reluctant to come talk to a couple of us. And he's like, I really need some help <laughs> because this, this isn't working. And when we, we used to, we had video cameras in there. And so we watched a couple of the tapes, but we also watched them like live. And what had shaped up was, or when we were talking to him, what was going on is he's like, he'll go through, but it's not until I, I put the wand in at certain parts to be able to like, kind of like coax through, right? And when we watched the tape, what essentially happened was instead of selecting for when you approach the hoop and get close to the hoop and then uh, pop, popping the wand then and feeding, what was happening is, is uh, it essentially shaped up to where it would like go into a corner and just kind of hang out. <laughs> and that, that was the SD for let me put the thing in there and try to guide it up to the hoop. Yeah. He and so the student very well, the fish, the food. fish yeah, straight the up. <laughs> yeah. The fish was doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing. It was just hanging in the corner. And like, if I hang here long enough, I'm going to get some food. <laughs> <laughs> but like typically they go on the bottom, even though there was a grate there and they try to like uh, forage for food. No, this thing just sat <laughs> just, just, like, just floating. And I was like, well, you shaped something pretty cool. I don't know what you I mean, that, that goes to prove that behavioral timing is a, is just as critical as anything else. It was unbelievably how if you were off by just a split second um, that it would totally wreck what your intentions were and you would shape something else up. I remember uh, uh, sometimes people would forget to unplug the water filter that was running in there. So you'd unplug the water filter for your like five or 10 minute session. And the water filter would uh, just blow the flakes. So sometimes people would be in there, they'd press it and then all of a sudden the bl flakes blow by. So the fish would literally learn like swim away from the hoop even though they had just approached. But it was because that split second of those flakes getting uh, blown by would lead to it turning and swimming away. So there was all sorts of weird stuff that would shape up there. <laughs> it was my favorite. I learned so much from fish. So much. What are you looking at, Dimitri? I was just looking up, uh, I was trying to find an article about the amount of, uh, like, the, 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 the neurological contact time it takes uh, for a stimulus to actually actually connect to you neurologically speaking and uh, I can't find an article here but Google says 300 to 500 milliseconds I would remember reading article 0. 0.7 but 0. 0.7 would be uh, 700. 700, milli 700 so I mean like this is actually even less than what I thought it was so I mean like you got to think about it you have 0. 0.3 to 0. 0.5 seconds 
amount of time for there to be a neurological connection to the particular stimulus that's being presented, right? So like, you know, if we're talking about timing, we're talking about all these things like delays create exaggerated stretches. Um, and again, for a delayed reinforcer to have an effect, there has to be a, you know, you have, there's certain levels of uh, sophistication and a refinement in our nature of the skill for that to matter. So for something like a fish, think about that. Like it's got to be instantaneous. It's got to be there. It's got to be there to be shaping or you're, you're losing content. Yeah. A speed, a speed of reinforcement was shaped up greatly in me. It was like, yeah. as soon as it happened immediately. And yeah, I carried that everywhere. Matters. Immediacy matters. I mean, disc, right? Deprivation, immediacy, size, and contingency. It's a, it's a little old school thing that I don't hear people talk about. I didn't know that one. Disc, yeah. It's not just for golf anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what were you guys, I mean, what were you guys getting at with this? Is that what you guys were getting at? Just trying to focus on timing or? I wanted to make, cause I, I wrote this. I, I wanted to make Darcy the have, have done everything right based on her education, right? She, she identified the gap. She went in, she practiced it. She targets, she, she targeted it to fluency and then it wouldn't stick in the chain. Yeah, because she did fluency too, which is uh, usually a big step people skip. Yeah. So you actually, that was a nice little touch where you're like, she's even doing fluency, dude, and she's not getting it. So what are you going to, because usually my go-to in these kinds of situations are, did you do a composite analysis and break down the skill and teach it fluency? She dropped so, tool skills on you real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she did. So I, She did I, drop some tool skills on me. So I was, uh, I was good. It was fantastic. I wanted, to, I wanted to check all the boxes that were going to happen prior and make it a little bit more about like a nuance and maybe even dipping into what is beyond a lovely binder full of programs and, and CILs and, and lovely assessments and how maybe sometimes, and I don't want to counter the points you made about rigid procedures and knowing those steps and having that down pat, but I, I think of it like music, right? You have to have, if you're playing music, you have to have the mechanics down and you have to be able to play other people's songs before you come in and you can improv and do have your own fluency with yeah, that. So I think part of this discussion too is, she was great at playing other people's songs. Her skills were on point. Everything was tuned beautifully. But now it's the shift beyond those programs and how we make things a little bit more natural and, and fluid. So it was almost like everything was pretty much going right, but it wasn't working. Now what? Yeah, because you can you can you can hear the sheet mu- sheet music version of the blues, and then you can hear Steve Ray Vaughan playing. Mm-hmm. It's a different animal. And, you know, if you try to just start off improv, you're just squawking on a horn. You have to have like the underlying, you, you, exactly. you, you have to have the underlying piece there and, and the yeah. mechanics to be able to make the decisions in the moment when it. they come up. That's where that graduated guidance comes in. If we're going to make this metaphor full circle, it's yeah. how do you just fluently nuance and help teach that skill? Yeah. Graduated guidance is one of those things that like, I mean, I just hate the I, least the most, most the least. Uh, I mean, it just, I, I, I I haven't written a program that procedurally rigid in so long, but I mean, that's in today's world, you know, with so many new people coming into the field, you need to be that explicit and you need to have those kinds of instructions, which makes it that much more important that you can teach that kind of like, you know, that the jazz performance that we're talking about, you can teach that fluid performance of the thing and that clinical judgment, the CJ, you know, so that people can perform these things adequately into a meaningful fashion. No, I hundred percent agree with that. I, yeah. I really, I, I, I like this one, even though it was like not a complicated one necessarily to solve. I like this because we don't talk enough about skill acquisition. We hyper focus on controlling behavior and all that stuff. And like we talk about FCT, but we don't actually talk about how do you actually create stimulus control and like where does stimulus control, you know, come from and all that stuff and like the actual shaping process of a procedure and of a skill itself. So that's a, it's a, it's a muscle. I don't get to flex that much anymore. So it's nice. Every day when I come home from work, I stand at my front door holding eight different things in my arms while trying to dig my keys out. And I'm like, where does big six plus six fluency translate into like holding a thermos with like these three fingers while you're trying to get your key ring out with these two fingers. And it's like, how do we shape to the natural things that actually have to happen? No, yeah, we could teach an individual, put the cup down on the table, but I'm too stubborn to do that. I want to carry all the groceries in in one go, so I have to make it more complicated on myself. But there are so many steps in between those things where you're troubleshooting for your life because you're an impatient idiot like myself, and you just need to like <laughs> get there and get in. When we're teaching someone to carry things or strength modulation or, or grip or whatever those pieces are, that's a very hard nuance to teach. How do you get from point A of grasp to point triple Z 
of you've made it in the door without yeah. letting the Yeti roll under your car. You know what I mean? Well, I will say that that's also a limitation of fluency training for these kinds of skills. You know, I mean the micro, the, the micro sequencing and stuff. I mean, that's, you know, me talking, there's no study on that and there's not a lot of publications on flu on precision teaching because they just didn't publish for him. Um, but, uh, and, and there is a little bit of a cult of precision teaching where what? people, people <laughs> think that PT is somehow the magical solution to everything, which is also false because stimulus control, behavior, timing, and prompting do play roles in these things, especially relative to capacity, fine and gross motor skills, as well as verbal skills. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a holistic approach to these things that matter significantly just to, to make sure that I'm not anyone who might hear this doesn't think that I'm over placating to the precision teachers because those are necessary. Um, but I will say that uh, there's value in everything, right? And it's definitely a good one for small aspects of skills. If there's deficit. Was it a comfy trip for you going to Santa Clarita today? Is it a I, you bit? know what? Th- thank you for that guys. I, I had a really, really tough day today. So that was actually very, uh, very nice break from reality. To just kind of <laughs> talk about how to teach a seven year old, not to pause in the middle of her. Uh, I forgot her, to mention, I wrote, you, I wrote you in as living in Hollywood. So it was actually like a hellacious, like two hour drive in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise you, ways. I feel like I had a two hour drive in real life. <laughs> so I definitely brought that kind of impatient energy to the scenario. <laughs> That's we can tell when you're get, running out the door. Just trying to get, that, get, that, get out of there ASAP. <laughs> if you're earning BACB CUs, your code word is faulty stimulus control. Again, that word is faulty stimulus control. You can just head over to our website, complete a quick process, and you'll have your CUs delivered to your email inbox. So one more last time. So one last time, that code word is faulty stimulus control. The views expressed during the explanatory fiction podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions made in the analysis are not reflective of any position of any other entity other than the authors. And since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to revision, change, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity. This podcast is to educate and inform, provide discussion, and does not constitute professional advice. Remember again that the variables in this case were randomly generated as well as the name and the episode imagery. Thank you math, thank you science, and thank you artificial intelligence. Rhino LLC is an approved continuing education provider that is ACE number hashtag OP-19-3037 and the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, also known as the BACB, a registered trademark, does not sponsor or approve or endorse Rhino LLC, the materials, information, or sessions identified herein. Thank you for listening.